Harini, now Dr. Ekta will be taking us through the um, points that she was talking as it come at so far. Sorry about the technical problem. Uh, I will just uh, go through uh, my slides. Uh, we started, initiated with that showing this chart. This is the National Antimicrobial Prescription Chart. Uh, this is a national document with uh, H number. This is H1338. This is a dedicated chart for antimicrobials. Uh, as antimicrobials are a special group of medicine we are using uh, this special chart to prescribe antimicrobials. It should be attached to the BHPs of all patients who are on antimicrobials. I just uh, summarized the gravity of the problem. Uh, it's a global public threat uh, and it's very uh, costly and very uh, huge number of people are dying with this problem. Uh, it was just 1.27 million in 2019, but it will be uh, 10 million in 2050, not that far away. Actually, uh, this is uh, more than cancer deaths. Cancer deaths will be around 8 million in uh, 2050, but uh, this is more than that, just to highlight the fact that AMR is a huge problem. And uh, it has significant e economic impact as well. Uh, so the other thing I highlighted our own continent, that is Asia, together with Africa, uh, contributing 90% of the uh, problem. And our own statistics, our blood culture uh, resistance rates are very high. Uh, almost all our antimicrobials, including our last resource antimicrobials nowadays are resistant. So if we compare it with uh, the developed country, we are in very bad situation. They are red. This is comparison of resistance in United Kingdom and Sri Lanka, Klebsiella pneumonia in blood cultures 2021. They are red resistant rate of merapenem is zero, our rate is 48%. The problem is uh, making a double trouble because we don't have antimicrobials. Uh, our pipeline is empty. There is a slow production. So this is sad, bad and pathetic situation. Uh, so nobody can wait uh, for this. So that uh, global 68 World Health Assembly recognized AMR as a global threat and they adopted the Global Action Plan. There they highlighted the fact overuse and misuse of antimicrobials as a main driver for development of resistance and at the same time uh, need to highlighted the fact that need to optimize the use of uh, antimicrobials. Parallel to that, our uh, all the countries, including our own country, Sri Lanka, we made the national strategic plan. Uh, AMS, antimicrobial stewardship, uh, is the key priority. So uh, we had that roadmap 2017 to 2022 earlier. Uh, we did certain, certain uh, strategies of that uh, roadmap, but we were unable to complete everything. So uh, again, we made this plan that is 2023 to 2028 five-year plan. Antimicrobial stewardship, uh, that stewardship is defined as the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Antimicrobial stewardship refers to coordinated interventions designed to improve and measure the appropriate use of antimicrobials. Uh, if I simplify further, by optimally managing what we have. Uh, what is the goal of antimicrobial stewardship? Actually, that is better care. Stewardship improve, improves clinical outcome. Antimicrobial stewardship is important not only to the society, but to individual patients. Our main name, right drug for the right bug with the right dose through the right food for the right duration. Thank you, Dr. B.
it and actually in her country, whether we have taken any measures with regard to antimicrobial stewardship. I mean, well, uh, we may be having our national strategic plans, but is it really, it's, uh, is it realistic to implement antimicrobial stewardship in our country? Yes, Chaturi, we have been doing it uh, for several years, but uh, this year, again, uh, we are, uh, we have selected several, actually four things as low hanging fruits with regard to national antimicrobial stewardship program. You all aware about that, uh, our aware classification circular, I am coming to that later. And the next thing, our empirical and prophylactic use of antimicrobials. We review that guideline uh, as a team together with other colleagues and the help of Minister of Health. And the next speaker uh, will talk about that. So uh, remaining two, that is AMS guideline and implementation of antimicrobial prescription chart. Those are the four things, uh, four low hanging fruit actually we have selected. You know that the meaning of low hanging fruits, that means doable and simple and things uh, that are mother nature theory. Uh, uh, so AMS guideline, uh, today we are not focusing on this. I think we have done it in so many uh, programs in uh, near future. Uh, so in the past, so in near future also we are talking about this uh, more and more. So today's, uh, we are focusing on antimicrobial prescription chart. Yes, I wanted to come to this. Let's focus on this national antimicrobial prescription chart. I think some of us in the audience might not be really aware about this uh, new kit on board. Uh, some may have not even known that that BHT was expecting. Leave aside uh, whether the kit was on. Maybe some other hospitals have really implemented it to some level. So let's focus, uh, um, can you just give us a backstory of this antimicrobial prescription chart? When was it implemented and how? Uh, yes, Chaturi, uh, in several hospitals, uh, we have been doing this for so many years, months, so on. But as a national uh, circular guideline and national chart, Actually, it came three months back. Uh, so if I talk uh, further, what we did, we got down all the charts, their own charts. We have been using our own charts. We got down all the charts and we appointed the subcommittee from the college and we went through it and made this final version. Mm -hmm. Not only that, uh, we got uh, uh, inputs from our other colleges as well as we had discussion with ministry also uh, with the help of all these charts and other colleges and the ministry finally uh, this final version came uh, with the guide how to fill this uh, how to get this uh, down the, how to get this chart uh, and who are responsible to fill this up and not only that, in the future, we are planning to do certain certain audits, what is happening and what is the uh, outcome, so on. It's a, uh, it's a uh, huge project, basically. So there are important as well. Yes, yeah. so, so many, uh, yeah. Challenge. We thought of introducing this uh, because this is very, very important uh, for many other things of our antimicrobial steward uh, programs. So optimization of antimicrobial is our main target. So indication, dose, route, frequency, you can uh, see the chart again. So everything is there. Uh, you are supposed to fill this up. Then a uh, minimization of misuse, inappropriate, and overuse. So reviewing is the answer. What's uh, I think you all also having the same experience, my experience also same that we are so keen to initiate antimicrobials, but not that keen to review or omit or de-escalate or those things. So reviewing is a must. So we have given a, a very important place uh, in this chart for the reviewing part. 
then proper documentation of allergy also uh, we are highlighting because uh, than ever before day by day we are hearing that uh, various unwanted things happening because of that allergy then we are encouraging collection of cultures before antimicrobials so in our chart there is a special cage for that the other important thing we are facilitate collecting data for audits i told you that in our ams program we are we need to monitor our system. So what is happening? So we need to collection of data. So for that also, that point prevalence surveillance, we are circular national anti, whether we are adhering national antimicrobial guidelines, all this data easily we can collect, provided that you all feel this property. Uh, and finally, this is facilitate our stewardship routes. So uh, let's now uh, further focus on the National Antimicrobial Prescription Chart. So who should be filling this chart basically and who should be maintaining? Can we get to know more about this chart uh, along with the components of the chart? Please? Yes, definitely. Uh, this is a teamwork. So basically medical officers and nursing officers are responsible for completing the chart. I talk about nursing officers part first, the demographic data of the patients, they should fill this up. Then details of cultures taken prior to the admission of antimicrobials, they can fill that cage as well before, uh, because the doctor basically initially uh, uh, not everything noting in the BHT, so that collecting cultures and all nursing officer can uh, transfer from that BHT to our chart. Then when they administrate the antimicrobials, they should mark in the relevant cages. So uh, I think you can see everything here. Uh, so demographic data and uh, the antimicrobials are there. So uh, they have put some mark with the, after giving the antimicrobials. If I uh, come to the doctor's part, they should fill the history of drug allergy, then indication for antimicrobials. Uh, that is very, very important. Then only we can check whether uh, that is matched with our, whether they are adhering our guideline. Uh, if somebody say that's, that they are uh, treating for UTI and completely that the guideline says certain, certain uh, things and uh, uh, that uh, primary therapy, alternative therapy, so on. So somebody might uh, prescribe totally different thing. So we can check with that indication whether it is matched with our guideline, uh, the, the selection of antimicrobials. If there is no designated cage for the indication in the chart, it should be mentioned on other cage. But I what I am highlighting, somehow or the other, they should mention their indication. Uh, the final infection diagnosis should be completed immediately upon reaching the diagnosis. We know that uh, on admission, sometimes we are just guessing something and later, finally, we are coming to some other diagnosis. There is a separate case for that. Uh, when prescribing the antimicrobial, mention the generic name, route, dose, and frequency in the relevant cages. It's very uh, important. So now in this chart, I do see some mystery letters in the cage where the name of the antimicrobial should be denoted. You see letters say P, P, and S. What are those letters about? Each and everything in this chart uh, for a purpose. So, uh, yes, uh, let's talk about that P, E, and S person. The T also they are in the down. P means uh, prophylactically, E means empirically, and S means specific. Uh, you all know that when you come across a patient, first, we are starting something, suppose septic patient, we are starting something empirically. Uh, so if you are starting meropenem uh, for a septic patient, you have to mention meropenem, document meropenem, as well as you have to circle the uh, E, 
just to not that this started empirically. So prophylactically, I don't think uh, I need to explain further the surgical prophylaxis or medical prophylaxis, then you have to settle that. Then that specific, uh, just uh, elaborate on that. So we are starting something empirically and before starting antimicrobials, we are recommended to collect all the cultures. Then uh, later on, you are getting the report that this is, uh, for example, uh, polyform, E. coli, so on, and which is sensitive to keftriaxone, kefiroxime, and uh, what I mean that compared to merapenem, uh, this is uh, not that broad the spectrum drug. So you are supposed to de-escalate your therapy to that. So uh, then uh, what you can do, you can omit your merapenem and you can go for your paramoxifel, for example, so in that case, that is the specific therapy. I don't know whether you all can read uh, this. This chart we have mentioned that initially they started something and omitted. Uh, after that, they have gone for the second one that is a specific therapy, initial one, empirical therapy. Like that, uh, you have to circle EPOS. Thank you, there are three more missed letters. A W R. Some of us in the audience may not know about D three. I mentioned earlier. I am coming to that aware classification. You all can remember that. Uh, you know that we had red light antimicrobials uh, uh, earlier, and it has been replaced by aware classification circular. A means access. W a means watch and RE means reserve. We are, uh, actually this is WHO uh, document, but we have adopted according to our needs. We have adopted it to Sri Lanka and this is the list. You can't read it, but I'm uh, sure that you are aware about that and you are having this circular. So access group, watch group and reserve group. Access group basically, uh, uh, we expect you all to use more and more. That is uh, low tendency to develop resistance as well as uh, narrow spectrum, basically compared to narrow spectrum drugs, basically in this list, then uh, any hospital of uh, Sri Lanka from uh, peripheral units to national hospital, this, this is available, access group is available. When I come to watch, that is compared to Access group uh, watches more broad spectrum as well as tendency is more to develop resistant. So that watch group antimicrobial, uh, uh, anybody can start, but after, to continue after three days, they need either their consultant's approval or microbiologist approval. Then that reserve group, that last resort antimicrobial, uh, we should initiate it with uh, with the MDT discussion with the microbiologist approval as well. So that is our uh, last resort as well as uh, so many, uh, because of many reasons we should reserve these antibiotics. This is not the time to discuss everything, but basically you can see that pyramid access watch and reserve, we should use more and more from the access group, then watch and uh, uh, as much as possible, you should reserve, reserve group for the uh, our multidrug resistant organisms and all. So that uh, again, coming to this chart, uh, that letter A for access group, then letter W for watch and the R for the reserve group. Purpose of, I think it is clear for you all now. Now, uh, let's move to the chart again, uh, moving from uh, reserve group to the reliefs. Now, uh, this chart has space for reliefs after the completion of day two, day seven, and day 10. So what's the purpose of these reliefs? Are these compulsory reliefs? Or on the other hand, can the reliefs be done, uh, reliefs be done on any other day other than these three? Very first sentence I want to tell, Review should be done daily. Uh, generally, what I say uh, that uh, when you go to a patient with uh, 
with a diarrhea, our mind, when we go there, our mind is set to ask the question whether uh, the patient is having uh, more and more episodes of diarrhea or getting better or studying. So high temperature patients, actually when we go there, before the patient, our eyes goes to that uh, temperature chart to see whether it is coming down, going up, or the swinging or something like that. Likewise, patients who are on antimicrobial, doctor should go with the idea whether we need to continue this antibiotic, whether we need to omit, whether we can de-escalate, so on. That means every day we should review our patients' antimicrobials. But as our uh, uh, According to our chart, that 48 hours, 7 days, and 10 days, mandatory review, and they should uh, put their initial, their signatures, short signatures, just to make sure that they are reviewing the uh, antimicrobials. We know that uh, there are a few conditions that, uh, such as endocarditis, meningitis, septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, so on, we need to continue intravenous therapy for a longer duration. But all the others, actually, we can stop, we can uh, de-escalate, and uh, sometimes we can make it oral. So relieving is very, very, very important uh, aspect. So you have an example for us? So let me go through. Yes. You can see from this chart uh, that nursing officer part and everything uh, has been nicely filled and allergic care, then they are uh, going to start uh, antibiotics. The indication is UTI. They have collected blood and urine. So they have started for Amoxicel. You can see that uh, that has been started empirically. So E has been circled. Then that is in the access group. So A also circled. Then they have uh, given uh, intravenous uh, 1.2 gram eight hourly. Then uh, that is ticked and initials are there after completing 48 hours. So uh, probably due to culture results, day three, uh, day three morning, Amoxiclav has been omitted and went for meropenem. Example, ESBL, probably ESBL. So now meropenem is specific therapy. Now that S is circle as well as that is in the watch group, W is circle. Now it's going on. I think it, it is clear now. Yes. Um, okay. Now we have had uh, heard about the backstory of the National uh, Antimicrobial Prescription Chart. And uh, you were telling earlier that uh, uh, few of um, the hospitals had several charts on their own. And I'm pretty sure that you also, as a champion in antimicrobial stewardship, has uh, taken a lot of trouble in your respective hospitals. Now, having had all those challenges to implement this streamlined National Antimicrobial Prescription Chart, I'm just uh, keen to ask from you, is the ch are the challenges over? Oh, now since we have implemented this National Antimicrobial Prescription Chart, are you expecting any more challenges? Uh, yes, uh, we had uh, many challenges those days, but now it is an easy job actually. Now circulars are there, guidelines are there, then the, we are getting this chart free of charge from the ministry. So main part is over, but still uh, we are having few challenges. Anyway, change in the practice is the problem, but uh, I'm happy to share my experience. Now, each and every PhD is uh, where they have prescribed antimicrobials, it has been prescribed in the chart. So I think that is almost 100%. And duplicating also no longer there. That was another problem those days. Now they have used to prescribe antimicrobial only in the chart. Main two main problems basically no longer there, but relieving it's sorry to announce, but that is the truth. But relieving uh, that is still not up to the mark. I make this opportunity to kindly request from you all please do that. Without relieving, I think our main we can't achieve our main goal. So please do that. 
Dr. Deepika, various hospitals, the audience from uh, representing different uh, institutions here, uh, would have experienced this national antimicrobial prescription chart to varying degrees. Some may have uh, just started implementing it, some may uh, be uh, not really good at reviewing, as you mentioned. So um, just um, as we are also behind the schedule at the time, um, to um, close this session, uh, part one of the session of the CME today, uh, can you give us the way forward? What will be your take home message? As I mentioned earlier, here and there, uh, uh, we have been using that. But now, uh, it is very well established uh, for the phase one of this uh, implementation of this chart, that is where there are microbiologists either on-site or off-site. For the phase one, uh, we expect to implement this uh, as an all-island service. So start small, think big. The more you dream, the more you achieve. Don't forget that where uh, there is a wheel, uh, there is a way. So I believe, I think, I expect in the near future, we can implement this as uh, an all island service. And uh, my take home message, uh, antimicrobial prescription chart is the foundation of the uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs in hospital. So uh, again, my final request also, please uh, adhere our guidelines and circulars and uh, things. And uh, according to that, fill this up, do your review. That is the most important thing. Uh, we have a long way to go. We are having many strategies, many, many things to do. Uh, in the future. So uh, uh, anyway, a journey of a thousand miles is said to begin with a single step. So please do this simple and doable thing first correctly. So then we can go ahead uh, for the next level. Finally, antimicrobials save lives. The more we use them, the more we lose them. Let's save antimicrobials for our uh, next generations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Devika, for that very interesting and uh, informative session. I'm happy to have moderated this session. Thank you. And let's uh, go on with the uh, part two of the CME program. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Deepika Beva Narachi and Dr. Chaturi Gunasekara. May I now invite Dr. Dananja Namali, consultant microbiologist from the Colombo North Teaching Hospital, uh, to be the speaker of the next session, which is Select the Right Antimicrobial. This session will be moderated by Dr. Nama Jayavardhanan, Honorary Secretary of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists. We encourage all the speakers or the listeners uh, online to send in their messages through the chat messages through Zoom, and we will be taking all the questions at the end. And these can be directed for the speaker of the first session or the second session, and we will have all four uh, resource persons on stage uh, finally to take any questions that is directed to us. So please keep sending your messages on the chat, and we will be taking them at the end. Uh, now we are ready to start the next session. Over to you, Dr. Dananja and Dr. Nama. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is the second part of the uh, program. So I'm Namal, and I have, the, I have with me here uh, Dr. Dananja Namali, consultant microbiologist at the Colombo North Teaching Hospital. So we heard about antimicrobial resistance. We heard about stewardship. We heard about the antimicrobial prescription chart. So uh, now we are going to talk about how to select the right antimicrobial for your patient. So Dr. Dananja, thank you very much for being here. Um, I would like to ask you, um, what factors do you have to consider when we are starting an antibiotic empirically? Um, can you just elaborate on the factors that uh, are important to consider? Yes, Namal. First of all, let me thank uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka College of Microbiology for having us for this important discussion. Uh, 
so starting antimicrobials will be something that you all will be doing in your day-to-day -day life. So when we think about the factors that we have to consider, they can be broadly categorized into cost factors, drug factors, and also another third new factor, a bug factor. Usually when we start something, some medicine, we just consider about host and drug factors now. But in this case, we have a third guest as well, which is the bug. So, under these headings, uh, you have to know about the, you know, our human beings are in various uh, milestone and they are having various physio physiological variations when you get a patient in your either emergency department or in your outpatient department. So we have, this is very important when you are prescribing an antibiotic. So they may be pregnant, they, they may be in their early pregnancies, they may be an elderly patient, it may be a, just a kid or a neonate. So that plays a very place, a very important place when you are selecting your antibiotic. The next important host factor is whether the patient is having any comorbidities or immunosuppressive conditions. As you all know, we are having a very big population of immunocompromised patients uh, nowadays uh, because we are having very uh, advanced therapeutic modalities, including many, many immunosuppressant drugs. And, and also some therapeutic pro procedures like uh, transplantation. So we are having patients who are on a lot of immunosuppressants. And also another very important factor, which has been earlier also mentioned, whether the patient having known allergies to any drugs or foods. And also another very important factor, especially in the doc for the doctor who first encounters the patient, whether the patient is in sepsis or in acute condition or not. Then, then about the drugs, then you have you should have some idea of the spectrum of the antibiotics and as was described earlier, the aware category, which is mainly based on the spectrum of the drug. And also pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of a drug is also very important. These factors of any drug, any medicine is important, but when you are considering antimicrobials, you are going to hit a target very specifically. Otherwise, you might miss your hit. So considering these factors are also very important. Uh, and also the bug factors, which is not uh, inferior to other things that I spoke, is also important. The epidemiology of the uh, but in our in the setting, whether this is hospital acquired or a community acquired infection, then the bug and their resistant or sensitivity pattern will be different. And also local antimicrobial susceptibility pattern in your locality, in your hospital, in your institution, or in the country is also plays an important role. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Danija, for that explanation. So now you talked about the patient. I think uh, the patient has to be a very important deciding factor when we consider an antimicrobial. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be a one glove fits all kind of situation. So uh, how does the patient's presentation affect the choice of ent empiric antimicrobials? Yes, when we talk about empirical antibiotics and rationalizing treatment, there is something that I don't want you to overact in rationalizing. That is when you encounter a septic patient or a patient who is in impending septic shock. So in these cases, you all are familiar with the one-hour sepsis bundle. So you don't have much time left. You have to act quickly. Time is the critical factor. So time zero will be the Time zero will be the time that you encounter the patient and you have to quickly act and administer broad spectrum antibiotics. Here we are not going to take a lengthy history and all that, but administer broad spe spectrum antibiotics and try as much as possible to take at least two blood cultures before starting uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. And also, 
if the patient is not that safety, not that safety, you have time in your hand. So you can go through the patient, take a detailed history and examine a patient and try to smartly start your antimicrobials. So try to find the focus, try to do some diagnostic tests, including some, maybe some imaging, and you are not in a rush. If the patient has been having fever for a long period, why rush and start antibiotics without taking cultures? Why rush and start antibiotics without taking a good history? So take a good history, talk to the patient, build up a rapport with the patient, even in GP setting, talk to patient and you will build up some confidence with the patient. Then even if you have not prescribed antibiotics, they will come as they are trusting, they have built up a trust on you. So the next time also, even they are not well, they know that doctor is somebody who, whom I can talk to. So definitely they, you will not lose the patient. They will definitely come to you the next time as well. So, and also if you have started antibiotics, always document a working diagnosis with some level of certainty or uncertainty. Say, you, you, we are jolly well sure that it is a UTI. That may be a very simple diagnosis, but in many cases it is not so. So probable, possible, this is a word that I might, I may be using, you know, 100 times a week in my day-to-day -day practice. So whatever, it's okay. You know that you are uncertain. You know that you are certain. If you know what you are doing, that is what we need. Thank you, Dr. Dananja. So um, when you're thinking of your empiric antibiotic therapy, we heard about the aware classification. Dr. Deepika was also talking about it. What are the implications of the aware classification when you are thinking about your empiric antibiotic therapy? Yes, as you have already got some idea about the aware classification, I will just touch upon how that uh, how these antibiotics have been categorized into these groups. So, excess antibiotics are generally narrow spectrum. They have low toxicities. And they have the most important thing, they have very low potency to develop resistance. Our antimicrobials, as Dr. Deepika mentioned earlier, are different from other medication. Why? They don't affect only in the patient that you use them. They affect the other, other people who are around as well. That is why when you select a narrow spectrum antibiotic, the collateral damage or the effect on other bugs who are surrounding maybe in our body, our microbiota, or maybe other people who are living around us will be least affected when you use excess antibiotics. So the idea is, you can see they are very simple drugs, amoxicillin, co-amoxicillin, ampicillin, but if you, you, if you can use these drugs in very many occasions, especially in the outpatient setting, that will help us to prevent AMR or antimicrobial resistance. The watch antibiotics comparatively are broader spectrum. They have higher toxicity because of the nature of the broad spectrum per se. They, they, are ten, they tend to cause more resistance in the bystander organism or in, the, uh, in our environment as well. So they should be uh, separated or uh, should be used without uh, after thinking twice always. Then coming to the reserve antibiotics, as was expressed earlier, it is a very, very last line antibiotics. But they may not be very broad, broad spectrum, as you think. Somebody might think that polystyrene is a good drug than carbapenems. No, not at all. It is a drug which we have uh, stopped using because of the toxicities. And we have sort of reinvented them, reusing it because we have nothing to use on drugs. So don't never think that they are good drugs which are in reserve and which are called reserve and in this reserve group. But we have to use because we have lost our hopes, right? So always remember aware classification. Then WHO has, uh, with, this is the circular, which has replaced uh, the red light antimicrobial circular we, which we had for about four or five years, which we have implemented, which only talk about the restricted antibiotics, so previously called red light antimicrobial. Now it has been 
change and replaced with this uh, circular, which, which has a guideline to start all except watch as well as uh, restricted antibiotics. So this is the WHO booklet where they, it is called the WHO antibiotic book, mainly covers gamete acquired pneumonias. You can see in very many occasions, many of the, most of the community acquired infections, they have recommended excess antibiotics. And also, their target is to uh, limit 60% of the antibiotic prescriptions to excess antibiotics. This may not be a very difficult target. If you see WHO website, you can see there are many countries, many developed countries who have achieved this target. Thank you, Dr. Dhananjar, talking about the AVR classification. So, uh, as you said, we are trying to limit the use of uh, reserve and uh, watch antibiotics and use as uh, uh, around 60% of AVR uh, classified drugs as much as possible. So, what else do you have to consider? Do you have to know about, say, the spectrum of these uh, access and uh, uh, other group of antibiotics? Is it important? Yes, very much. When you are talking about rational prescription, knowing the spectrum of antibiotics is very important. But this is something that we, in day-to-day -day practice, we see that in our medical student days, although we learn all these, we have forgotten at least the drugs which cover gram-positive organism and drugs which cover gram-negative organism. Not only in Sri Lanka, I experienced this thing when I was doing my overseas training in Australia as well. So uh, don't worry, we have to know a bit on spectrum. So rather than elaborately talking about it, I will just give a few examples. There are certain antibiotics or anti antibiotics which cover only gram-positive organisms. Examples are fluproxamine, vancomycin, chicoplanin, clindamycin. They are not effective again. They don't or they don't have any gram-negative cover. If you take anti-pseudomonal drugs, if acidine, ciproplaxin, piperacillin, tazobactam, they have anti-pseudomonal cover in addition to their gram-negative cover. Say, for example, if you take if you take Zim or Keftrax or Cephalexin, they have a gram-negative co cover, but they are not anti-pseudomonal. Then again, anti-MRSA cover. There are certain drugs effective for uh, methicillin-sensitive staphylococcus sores. Even Flucloxylin O, carbapenem will be effective for methicillin sensitive step. But although carbapenems are a broad spectrum antibiotic, it is not effective against MRSA. So, anti MRSA drug would be vancomycin, clindamycin, cotrimoxole, citrofloxine, and so on. And also, now there is another bug which has come to the, you know, uh, come to the talk uh, in the recent uh, scenarios because we are using a lot of antibiotics because we are vehemently using third generation cephalosporin, this enterococcus, which is a gut bacterium in our gut, has become prominent and causing infections because it is resistant to, intrinsically resistant to cephalosporin. It has become a prominent bug, like in the case of uh, Acinetobacter baumania. So many of the drugs doesn't have many of the drugs don't have an anti enterococcal cover. But simple penicillin, ampicillin, vancomycin, or piperacillin, tazobactam, which are anti pseudomonal penicillins, have an anti enterococcal cover. So you have to know and or, or refresh your memory on spectrum of antibiotics when you prescribe. Well, thank you, Dr. Danja. So you are talking about um, anti-MRSA, anti-pseudomonal, anti-intracocal cover. Um, I mean, uh, is, that, is that all that is important? I mean, uh, what about, say, uh, knowing about your institution's antibiogram? Can you tell a little bit about what an antibiogram is? Yeah, this is also uh, has become a buzzword when you talk about AMR or antibiotics because uh, all, most of the guidelines say that you have to have some idea about the antibicro, antibiogram or the susceptibility pattern of in your locality or in your country or in your hospital, as I told earlier. So simply the 
uh, antibiogram is a summary or a summing up of result that you uh, that you get in by doing antimicrobial susceptibility testing in a lab. So you can summarize and get the sensitivity percentage of a particular organism or a group of organism and you can uh, sum up it and uh, give, give it to other clinicians and present it to other clinicians. So this is very important in prescribing because your uh, antibio antibiogram of your institution or our country may be very different from another institution or another country. For example, this is a chart that I have done in our hospital, Kalambu North Teaching Hospital. So we are producing the antibiogram annually. This is not the antibiogram, but I have summarized certain drugs. I have taken out certain drugs from our antimicro antibiogram and uh, made a graph. So you can see clearly how our resistant or sensitivity. Here I have taken the resistant pattern to show you how our pro how bad our problem is. So our res uh, third generation cephalosporin resistant remains around 60%. Uh, MRSA is around 50%. And uh, entero uh, vancomycin resistant enterococcus is around 20%. And carbapenem resistant uh, also has become around 20% in our blood culture isolate. So you know how bad we are doing when you have the O how good you are doing when you have the antibiogram results. Uh, so we heard about uh, the bug-related factors. So can we talk a little bit about the drug-related factors? Uh, we, we have heard of obviously about the words pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So can you elaborate a little bit more on these properties of the antimicrobials when we are prescribing? Yes, Namal, these are very important things, but uh, to explain well, I need a separate lecture because this is a very, a very important area. But just to highlight some points, pharmacokinetics are when, a, when you administer a drug to, drug to our body, until it uh, reaches the target, there are certain things happening. For example, absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism, and excretion. So drug has to face all these and then finally reach the target. And in pharmacodynamics, Uh, now the drug has reached the target and how it interact, how best it interact with the target and uh, demonstrate or uh, do it action. How better the action uh, action can be there is decided by the pharmacokinetics. So that may be like how frequently you are giving the drug, what is the dose of drug you are giving to achieve the best concentration and best heat. And, and also standard evidence-based guideline that we are frequently talking about when we are prescribing are based on all these factors, spectrum of antibiotics, antibiogram, and also pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties. So always, if you are stick, if sticking to a local guideline or a standard guideline, you don't have to bother much about thinking of these factors. That is why the guidelines are there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dhananja. So uh, I think uh, to elaborate uh, Dr. Dhananja's point more, we'll go uh, to a few case scenarios and to see uh, how and uh, why we will prescribe the antibiotic that we will. Um, so uh, these are some very common case scenarios which you will encounter in your day-to-day -day practice. So uh, this is one such case. So it's a 30-year-old previously healthy male who presented to the emergency department with fever, cough, and pleuritic type of chest pain. On examination, he's febrile, dysnic, with oxygen saturation on air around 90%. The respiratory rate is uh, around 36 beats uh, per minute. The blood pressures are normal. Uh, high WBCDC uh, around 14,000 with neutrophil leukocytosis and high blood urea, 35 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, Dr. Nananja, what do you think is the diagnosis? I think normal it is a case of community acquired pneumonia. So, what is the empiric antibiotic? 
So uh, when we are talking about the community acquired pneumonia, generally we have to consider the severity of the infection. With that only you decide whether the patient needs in ward care or you can manage the patient as an outpatient. So there are criteria in IDSA guideline, the new IDSA guideline. For example, they give major and minor criteria where you can uh, categorize your patient to whether it belongs to severe or moderate or uh, mild category. Then there are other ones which are which we are familiar with, like CURB 65, pneumonia severity index, which will guide you to uh, guess in which condition your patient is. So this is the uh, IDSA latest guideline, what it recommends to give for non-severe pneumonia, for amoxicillin uh, or either ketraxone or uh, plus or minus macrolide or flo flofinolone. Uh, for severe pneumonia, they uh, uh, prescribe uh, either ketraxone, macrolide or a quinolone. If the MRSA or pseudomonal cover is, if you think that that is needed, you can add some uh, anti pseudomonal and anti MRSA drugs, as we have mentioned earlier. In our national antibiotic, what we are have recommended for the uh, mild community acquired pneumonia is omoxiclo plus clarithromycin. And for severe pneumonia, either kefotaxine or you can go to higher range if you suspect, as we told earlier, if the community acquired MRSA is infection, we have to give a MRSA cover. You know, in these days, we are having an epidemic of influenza. So uh, we all know the secondary infection with Staphylococcus aureus or methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is somewhat common. So why we, we have not prescribed levofloxacin, which is a reserve drug in our country, in this in our regime is, one thing is UK has given a uh, warning for levoflux because it can cause tendinitis. It is a, a it can, could be a irreversible condition, but it is rare. In our setting, particularly, not because of this, because it is a second line TB drug, we have put levoflux under the reserve drug drugs. So we are not very loosely prescribing uh, levoflux. That is why our guideline has changed. So I would read out another uh, case scenario, which is uh, what we commonly encounter. A 30-year-old previously unevaluated lady presented with fever, dysuria, and frequency for one day to the OPD. On examination, she has mild loin tenderness, but vitals are normal. The patient's CRP is 30. The wise cell count is normal. What is the diagnosis and what is the empiric therapy? So... I think you all are familiar with this presentation. Uh, so it is a case of acute, uncomplicated pyelonephritis, obviously in a non-pregnant woman. And it is not severe. Patient's vitals are all right. So after collecting a urine culture, you can start, according to our national guidelines, for amoxiclo, oral, because the patient is all right. They can take uh, from uh, orally. And uh, IDSA guideline, which is quite old, is uh, recommending uh, ciprofloxacin, but only if the ciprofloxacin resistance is less than 10%. But in our setting, according to our national data, glass data, as well as in our hospitals also individually in studies, we have seen our ciprofloxacin resistance is around 60% or more. So definitely Cipro is not an empiric choice for us in for our setting because of the misuse. So NIF guideline is very simple. They are recommending cephalexine 500 milligram 8 hourly because cephalexine is very special because it uh, acquires a very high concentration in urine. So that is why that has become a drug of choice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Danch. I think that's very important to know because we encounter it uh, very often in our setting as well. Uh, so the third case scenario is a 50 year old male who had a routine medical checkup recently with a normal fasting blood sugar presented to the OPD with fever and mild cellulitis in the left lower limb. His vitals are normal. What is the recommended empiric therapy for him? 
Yeah. As you all know, cellulitis is also a very common condition that we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. So as this is a mild case, we can give oral antibiotics. So our national antibiotic guidelines recommend either amoxicillin or fluproxacin or cephalexine. Nice guidelines recommend fluproxacin. They specifically say if it is in the face close to the nose or eye to give for amoxiclor. So uh, what is the causative agent in, uh, uh, in cellulitis? It is either streptococcus pyogens or which or pyogens which fortunately remain sensitive to penicillin or it is staphylococcus aureus. So how are you going to identify whether it is staphylococcus aureus or streptococcus pyogens? Generally, this is not a hard and fast rule, but generally if the skin has some cracks and you know there is a wound or it is not very mm, looking uh, very uh, smooth and all, it could be staph. So you can start either penicillin or floxacillin because floxacillin or fluoxacillin is having the, uh, whatever the cover given by penicillin will be given by floxacillin. So please don't try to start high fi antibiotics for mild cellulitis. Your floxacillin or fluoxacillin will work for it. But we have to remember something because of our poor practices, which, are, which we are going to tackle as a group our MRSA rates are a bit high. So we have to, if the patient is not responding, definitely not as the first line agent, we have to think of MRSA. Thank you, Dr. Dhananjan. So uh, these are all very common uh, conditions we see in the outpatients department. So I'm going to move on to uh, something that we uh, see in the ICUs quite commonly. So what if a patient develops respiratory, uh, new onset respiratory symptoms, a worsening oxygen demand, and new shadows in the chest X-ray? Say he was already ventilated, and there are um, pulmonary hemorrhages, and uh, with the diagnosis of uh, leptospirosis. What is empiric antibiotic therapy in this patient? So this is not a very uncommon condition that we encounter in our day-to-day -day ICU practice. Many patients who are on, vent on the ventilatory support get ventilator-associated pneumonias subsequently. So in this case, we have to select an antibiotic which cover our hospital bugs, which are generally multidrug resistant. So here, your antibiogram is also very important, right? If you have isolated multidrug resistant acinetobacter, in the previous three or six months or previous year, you know that it may be, there is a uh, high chance that it may be a multidrug resistant bug. So you have to be ready with your broad spectrum antibiotics like piperacillin, tazobactam, kefaferazone, salbactam. And also if the MRSA risk is high in your uh, unit, you have to give anti-MRSA cover as well. So here we have sort of uh, lost our game because our infection control practices are not so good and we have used antimicrobial scrupulously maybe for this leptospirosis patient maybe the penicillin would have been enough maybe just uh, kefataxime or kefraxone would have been enough but somehow or other we have missed it and we have used antibiotics and we have missed on our infection control efforts and we have got the vaccine which should not be the happen routinely. So moving on from the medical patient to the surgical patient. Um, so what, what are the factors you will have to consider when we start surgical antibiotic prophylaxis? Yes, Namar. Most of the time in our day-to-day -day practice that we observe that sometimes, although we give antibiotics before a surgery, we have forgotten our basics or principles. We have forgotten why we are giving surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. We give surgical antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent the skin uh, colonizers, prevent skin colonizers to enter through the surgical wound and cause an infection. But sometimes there are instances that we administer surgical antibiotic prophylaxis just five minutes before doing the surgical cut. So it will not reach our bloodstream and reach the tissues where we need the relevant action. So you have to remember the principles of surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. It is only indicated for clean, contaminated, and 
contaminated surgeries. Maybe for clean surgeries in very few situations where the uh, consequences could be very dangerous, for example, implant uh, surgeries. And it has to be given one hour before the surgical incision and generally should be limited to a single dose in many, many cases and maximum three doses in certain categories and may need an extra dose if the surgery is prolonged or if the blood loss is massive. But unfortunately, uh, yeah, this is what we have recommended in our antibiotic guideline for surgical prophylaxis. It is usually either cefiroxime, coamoxiflo, or cefiroxime plus metronidazole. So, very simple because we don't have ketosoline, we have to give either cefiroxime or coamoxiflo. But this is a result of a point prevalence survey done in our hospital, Colombo North Teaching Hospital, where we found that in 62% of occasions, surgical antibiotic prophylaxis has been continued more than 24 hours. I won't say that all these 62% are irrational. Some people would have definitely had infection and might have needed to continuation of surgical prophylaxis. But definitely, it, is, it should not be 62%. So we have seen that we have forgotten our basics and principles so much that we are prescribing just for a post LSSC. We are giving when we are discharging the patient, we are discharging them with coamoxiflo. Even for normal vaginal deliveries, we are discharging our patient with coamoxiflo. So definitely, this should not be the way forward. Uh, so, Dr. Dhananjal, say, uh, now we talked about the medical patient, we talked about the surgical patient, uh, we talked about prophylaxis, uh, whichever way, say, now we have started antibiotics for our patient. Are we happy? Do we have anything else to think about now that our patient is on antibiotics? Is that the end of the road? Not at all. That is what previous speakers also talking about. That is not the end of the Story. We have started broad spectrum antibiotics. We have very, you know, uh, we were very worried about AMR and we have started the most narrow spectrum antibiotics. So, both ways we may be in trouble. So, we have to assess the patient, reassess the patient. Maybe you have to de escalate, maybe you have to escalate, maybe you can stop. It may not be an infection, it may, it may, it might have something which have mimicked an infection. Or it may be your diagnosis because we came to a probable diagnosis or a possible diagnosis. So maybe you have to uh, change your mind and okay, now it is something else. So always daily you have to reconsider about your antibiotics. Not only the choice of antibiotics, uh, whether we can shift from IV to oral. This is also sadly not happening. Even one dose of extra IV antibiotic is harmful to the patient. Imagine having the cannula and getting IV, certain uh, IV antibiotics when it give, if you have received it is very, very painful. So it's a bad experience as well as people can get cannula site infection. And I have experienced many patients who have got the cannula site infection Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia, especially in our dengue uh, season, getting endocarditis or getting septic arthritis and, ha and having long-term hospital stays as well as long-term disability. So don't, so as whenever it is possible, quickly change from IV to oral. And also you have to monitor for side defects. There are instances we are giving uh, drugs which are nephrotoxic, for days without monitoring the renal function or liver function sometimes. And also appropriate duration also we have to consider for many infections. Now new guidelines are coming up that short duration antibiotics are enough. But there are certain conditions where the bug become sort of dormant and they have their various tactics to, uh, to stay in our body. So in those cases, because our immune system has been sort of cheated by the bug. So there are certain conditions that we have to get new antibiotics, evidence-based guidelines are there for prolonged period, but in many occasions, short antibiotic duration is enough. 
So we talked about what antibiotic to give. Uh, we talked about uh, how long to give. Um, what about what, when not to give antibiotics? Uh, can you tell me, uh, are there any specific uh, conditions where you don't have to give antibiotics? Yes, now my this is a be the microbiologist. This is a very favorite topic of me. So there are many infective conditions which do not need antibiotics. Acute pharyngitis, around 80 to 90 percent pharyngitis are caused by viruses. Acute sinusitis, same. Acute gastroenteritis, many are caused by viruses. But just think whether you have taken with one bout of diarrhea, whether you have not or taken dose of ciprofloxacin and stop just after taking two or three doses. And acute burns, it is just SIRS, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, acute pancreatitis. We have read in Bailey and Lau pages how the how the mechanism of acute pancreatitis, how it is different from an infection, how inflammation and infection differ. But sadly, we forget all that when we come to our practice. So remember, there are many conditions, we conditions and also infections which can be managed without antibiotics. Uh, thank you, Dr. Damajana. I'm a consultant, uh, microbiologist, uh, but I'm not teaching hospital for answering my questions. So um, that's enough for, I, I'm sorry, we went slightly over uh, time. I wonder whether the audience has any questions. So I'm going to hand over to the compare. Thank you, Madam. And uh, we would also like to invite uh, the other two speakers on stage uh, to commence the Q&A session. Um, the other speaker and yes, please, uh, the, all the resource persons. We would first like to open for the audience who are present here today. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and we can bring the microphone over to you. So my name is uh, Dr. Suranth Perera. So my question is, uh, when it comes to newborns, uh, basically in NICU, uh, we definitely put them on antibiotics for the prophylaxis. So we start CPIN and uh, kefotaxime. Sometimes the combination is that, or the CPIN and gentamicin. Gentamicin, the problem is if you don't do not do the uh, give the first dose and hold. Uh, the issue is we don't have the levels. That's what we do in UK. So because of that, we shifted more to a skepotaxi. One thing is, uh, so the issue is when we are ventilating, so then they deteriorate on the ventilator. We see sometimes the the chest x showing more uh, the appearance of new patches, etc. So uh, I think uh, Castle Street uh, and DMH people usually then go to the mirror panel combination rank and then I don't think it's really right uh, then they go for the other next level of medications so uh, and then top of that we don't get uh, positive blood cultures also so the uh, then we recorded the volume some people say the volume is not adequate 0.5 and then we waited the, uh, the before and after the uh, wait also the uh, uh, blood culture, some uh, specimen. So, uh, how should we handle this problem? Because, uh, because uh, true, we are focused on more on the adult side, but when antibiotic resistance can develop from a different uh, ecology area, and then it can be filtered out to other areas also. Because uh, when I look at some of your graph, high resistance for. Uh, certain antibiotic, not only level, uh, I mean, more uh, a more sophisticated antibiotics also. Uh, 
are you talking about negative blood cultures in cases of uh, so one, one of the problem is uh, in neonatology neonatal we have discussed this at national level also our blood culture yield is very low is it when you are starting empiric therapy for newborn for the first time or when you start antibiotics subsequently I think both instances. I mean, empirically started, it's had to be negative because of the their extreme prem their prematurity and the uh, more. In our, in our experience, when you are starting for the first time, uh, they are becoming positive. If they are, if there is a true sepsis, it may not be not be hundred percent, but definitely, in subsequent blood cultures become negative. I Maybe uh, although the bug is resistant to the particular drug you are giving in uh, vitro, when we are trying to grow, even the antibiotic concentrate when the antibiotic concentration is there, they don't grow. That is one weakness of our uh, yeah cultures. So that may that is something that we experience. But uh, in neonates, I think group B streptococcus, group A streptococcus, those things we isolate, but. Uh, Volume may be definitely... And the coliforms. Yeah. Cons. Cons, yeah. yeah. something that regarding uh, you mentioned that then uh, patient, the new, your kid will be on new ventilator and so on. Most of the time that respiratory infections, our blood cultures, uh, the positivity is low respiratory things that also they are. But the first time, as she mentioned, uh, our cultures uh, generally grow somewhat. The second time because of that antibiotic influence as well as that the respiratory things, rates are quite low. There is no as such bacteria, yeah, that's the really, thing. Yeah. So uh, because uh, more the baby get de uh, deteriorate, so we move from and can meropenem to ultimately cholestine also. So the, you know, what I am telling is, uh, uh, Niku may be not your focus most of the time. It's managed purely by the neonatal. Examples, cultures, but I mean that it is secretion and all at that time. It comes as mixed growth most of the time. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, I, 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 very focusedly I have followed it. So most of the time it comes as mixed growth. We don't get uh, adequate uh, guidance from the, this culture. But uh, in uh, in contrast, in UK, we start seeping uh, or kefotaxim. And when we start Vank and Meropenem, then the 90% of the bugs are cleared. We do not escalate into other level. What about your hospital culture system? Is it automated or manual? Do you have any idea? I think it's automated. Casas, it is automated. Back tech. Automated. Maybe the volume also affects Because these babies become more and more valuable. When they are born at 24 weeks, their weight is 550 grams. And when we they leave, remain in the hospital for 140, 120 days. And then time to time, they are back on ventilator. And they go back to the uh, uh, low dependent or ventilator. or ventilator, and then they come upstairs again for the ventilator. So none of us want to lose them, you know. And uh, if if you value them, if same thing happen in the private sector, the it's fifty to uh, five to ten million, the cost would be. control methods and hand hygiene rates are very good compared to the adult ICUs. So I can't imagine why the problem is so bad in our setting. It is not so, but they are getting, I mean, when the baby is uh, very premature, they have to anyway, due to other factors, they have to be on ventilator for a long time. So it's a sort of a big picture rather than a very clear thing to my knowledge. Thank you. So there are some comments uh, online. Um, would it be possible to explain in detail how to do the initial point prevalence survey according to the WHO methodology? 
So if this is going to take a lot of time, uh, if you could just breathe and maybe we, we can share a link uh, on the chat. Yeah, in, uh, this I is think we can share a link. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, we have done, uh, we have done in several places and several times also. So basically we are going uh, through that uh, WHO guideline. So uh, we are doing, uh, that depends on many factors that a uh, patient number and all. As far as I can remember, if it is less than 500, we can include all the patients. Uh, if it is beyond that, we can uh, use some kind of uh, sample. Uh, one, yeah, one in two patients, like uh, many things to be discussed anyway that is not a big task we have done it uh, in uh, one day that uh, generally after up to 8 am all the patients suppose uh, it is less than 500 patients in, uh, in the hospital we can go through each and every one so uh, 8 am up to 8 am uh, if you are going through all the patients when we go to the next ward it will be around 10 am or so but we are taking, uh, uh, collecting data only up to uh, admissions, only up to 8 a.m. So uh, uh, actually for those things also, the antibiotic prescription chart is very beneficial. Otherwise, uh, we have to go through the, our routine chart uh, and sometimes uh, BHT as well. Yeah, that's why we are highlighting the fact for everything to taking, collecting data, it's very important to fill the chart properly. We can share the link. Thank you very much. Um, there is a comment from Professor uh, Terence Rohanji Naya. Um, the more use, the more we use them, the more we lose them. This is not a correct statement. Antimicrobials are there to be used. We have to use them judicially. Ships can sink in the oceans while sailing. They will be more safe if they don't sail and be in harbors, but ships are meant to sail. This is the purpose. Similarly, antibiotics are meant to be used. Uh, an audit was done in a tertiary care hospital on antibiotics prescribing practices in 2022 in patients presenting with fever. Results were pathetic as kefotaxima and azithromycin were used even in confirmed viral infections. I think we need to audit these and implement policies as well. Would there be any comments on this? Uh, we agree with him, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think we should uh, give some explanation rather than just telling that uh, we are having that so many explanations. Uh, we use more and more in the sense we should cut down our misuse and overuse, basically. That's what we wanted to highlight, and we agree with him. Yeah, the, I suppose the judicial yeah, use of antibiotics. Basically, that's what we mean, but uh, hereafter we should add that part as well. Um, is it accurate to say that access antibiotics have a low propensity to develop resistance? Please explain. Access antibiotics have a low propensity to develop resistance. Yes, it is uh, uh, something that is uh, they have found because, say, for example, ciprofloxacin, it is a broad spectrum antibiotic. So uh, it has some genetic elements which can be transferred from one bug to another bystander bug. So cipro is a drug which, when it is used, it, it can induce development of resistance in their bystanders. But if you take amoxicillin or penicillin, it is not so. They are they don't have so much mobile genetic elements which can be uh, transferring to their bystanders. So it is something that which has been proven through studies, I would say. Something small thing I, I want to tell about PPS, point prevalence surveys. Uh, in dose, you can go to either daily defined dose, DDD or days of therapy. But I did in my institution of days of therapy because it was easy for me. Uh, defining uh, daily defined dose was a little bit complicated because pediatric dose is different, renal failure it is different. So that is, you maybe you can read and get some information. What I did was days of therapy. 
I also use the days of therapy, not the uh, DDD, daily defined days. Thank you, madam. Um, there is one question directed to the first speaker. Thank you for the initiative. One comment from the end users is the lack of a visual longitudinal clue on antibiotics in the new form as the dates for day one, two for each drug needs to be given separately for drugs and the x-axis is not longitudinal in calendar days. What are your views on this? But I mean, uh, several doctors and several nursing officers and everybody highlighted that fact. But uh, what our main aim at a glance, one particular antibiotic, how many days patient is on. Uh, so our routine drug chart, that is the only difference from our routine drug chart and this particular special chart. But here, of course, our main aim at a glance, just to see, uh, let's say, coamoxiclav two days, meropenem three days, uh, so on. But if we uh, if we put the date that way, it's more cumbersome. We have tried that and finally agreed for this, actually. And our purpose uh, at a glance to see uh, how, how many days. And if we do it that way, we can't use this chart uh, that days mainly date and review that suppose coamoxiclav starting dates is different from meropenem starting date. We have to put the date when we start new antibiotic. That's a must. Just to add something to that. Uh, I'm <laughs> Yeah, just to add something. Now, uh, this is actually uh, not our invention. Actually, it's a uh, uh, the internationally accepted way of uh, handling uh, the uh, making antimicrobial prescription charts. The main objective is to highlight the uh, number of days as well as now the review. The review columns are now in line. In, for all antibiotics after two days we have to otherwise it's very hard to uh, the, the, get that uh, outcome the review in one one uh, uh, the longitudinal line so this is the way that uh, the all over the world uh, the, the the antibiotic prescription charts this is how uh, the design right thank you thank you dr malika for the better explanation for that changed, right, when we get acclimatized to fill in this uh, microbial prescription chart, uh, the problem will be kind of uh, overcome as time goes. I think this, uh, this has been presented at the intercollegiate committee. A major disciplines, uh, they have uh, surgery, gene, and OSPI that they agreed with the drug chart, and uh, here and there a few changes have been made. So this will be a sort of a national uh, drug chart national level, the ag agreed drug chart for prescribing medicine. Once we get used to that, that won't be a problem. Uh, that's my experience initially. Yes, but uh, it is no longer there in my hospitals. So once they get used to that, you start feeling yeah feeling automatically automatically yeah to get used to that. There's a that, question. that should be the way we agreed for that as well. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, in addition to that, uh, two days back we had a discussion with the secretary also with the relevant colleges. There will be three drug policy for the OPD. If they are prescribing the fourth drug, they have to get a signature of the MIC. That is to restrict. So these are coming up. And then the third thing is most expensive four drugs will be monitored with each prescription. They had to justify the indication, everything, and they had to, if say ten to place five vials are given, and then uh, they had to return the filled forms to the pharmacist to get the next five vials, and then uh, they will be, the the details will be uploaded with a web based system, and will be analyzed. So more and more stringent mechanism will be implemented to monitor as well as curtail unnecessary prescription of drugs. The yeah, oh, I mean, yes, uh, no harm even. Everybody agree, whatever the budget for the care, to improve the care of the pa patient, uh, the, it will be invested. There's no issue about it. 
few more comments leading from this. Um, it is excellent news for having a prescription chart. What was the reason for not having the duration in the chart? If the prescribing clinician can continue to keep reviewing day two, seven, etc., but is not bound to stop if there is no duration for the prescription, what does the panel think? That depends. Duration depends on many factors. So I think... Uh, uh, yeah, at the start of the prescription, we can't just decide the decide on duration. So uh, most of the prescriptions generally should end at day 10. It should not go beyond day 10 unless there are specific indications. So that's why we limit this to day 10. So if uh, now... Uh, that's why there is a date and review as well. So date and review is mainly to stop antibiotics. Five, seven, ten, those are the durations generally. So uh, we must not go beyond day 10 unless there are specific indications like now infective endocarditis, deep-seated abscesses which are not drained. Likewise, uh, so... At the beginning of the prescription, it's very difficult to decide on the duration. I should make a comment on uh, who's commented to our online audience who is who can help who cannot see. This was uh, Dr. Malika Karunaratna, president of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, who answered that question um, together with the yeah. panel. But to add uh, something uh, very briefly, as a pediatrician, the duration all of us know guidelines specify five days, seven or ten, but. Uh, very correctly, those are sort of a, just a guideline, but uh, we have to, it's a patient-based uh, treatment. I mean, it's a, it varies from patient to patient. Uh, it's a responsibility of the prescribing clinician to review the daily status 24 hourly. Otherwise, you know, we de diagnose, we say five or seven days and we leave that patient uh, and then the rest of the management will be done. The SHO. So the, uh, when we start to stop, we have to review daily. A lot of dynamic things can happen. I, I mean, it's we can't predict, especially a critically ill patient. There's another comment. Um, doctors should document these on the diagnosis card. Um, I believe this was uh, in response uh, to one of the previous comments as well. Antibiotics given with duration or start and stop date antibiotic allergies, presence of MRSA, VRE, CRE, or other MDRO organisms with date and sample type, and that we need to encourage doctors to do MRSA screening and CRE screening when indicated. I believe the panel uh, agrees with these comments, uh, I suppose, were in response to a previous. Yeah, there are instances that we have isolated, say, for example, infective endocarditis, there is streptococcus, it MIC and all, we have given very nice results. Sad to say, even Burkholder amelioidosis. So we are giving now our own some uh, summary because VHD, the, I mean, the diagnosis card doesn't carry it. So it is very, very important. Yes. yes. Following up on that is MR, if MRIC screening is done on date of admission for septic patients, we can easily decide soon whether MRSA cover is necessary or not. And also the most likely reason for negative blood cultures in septic neonates is the extremely low volume of blood that is sampled. I think that was uh, in response to uh, Dr. Suranda Pereira's question. Um, I suppose yes. these comments are coming from the biologists. Um, there's another question. How about the treatment starting criteria in a pregnant lady without symptoms, but if UFR shows high white cell count? Generally, yeah, asymptomatic bacteria, we don't treat in healthy patients, but uh, in pregnant women and if the patient are awaiting a urological procedure, we treat. But this case, it is just asymptomatic pyuria. In my experience, it is an uncommon condition in pregnant women. It is very common in diabetics who are under uh, uncontrolled diabetics and all. But we don't treat them. But in pregnancy, asymptomatic pyuria should be thoroughly investigated, I suppose. 
There's another question. What is your recommendation use of cholestein in NICU? Again, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Uh, I suppose this will be for the uh the College of Pediatricians, or maybe we take it over. I I think cholesterol is not the first choice. But I I told you uh, because we when the, this uh, we experience with the extreme preterm babies, so the twenty two twenty three is a peri viable age, twenty four that is babies who are born four months earlier, they are really vulnerable. So time to time they are on the because uh, I mean situation they recover weaned off and then on CPAP suddenly again deteriorate and going back to the ventilator and the hemodynamic also becoming unstable. So there's sometimes the predictors of CRP rise is unpredictable. The classical picture we cannot find because their systems are very immature. So it's a sort of a uh, your experience plus whatever available indicators. Uh, we start antibody late only. We see so, uh, my WBC rising. Usually we don't see the rise of WBC. We see uh, the, the uh, leukopenia. And then instead of thrombocytosis, we see thrombocytopenia. Earlier sometimes thrombocytopenia we see. Initially, we see uh, when they are deteriorating, hemodynamics become unstable, time time desaturate, etc. So, uh, and, and, I mean, after six weeks, like four weeks, they have given so many drugs. So, sometimes we are back to the wall, we use cholesterol. I don't think that's the correct. We, we have a, always have the guilty feeling when we use the cholesterol. I'm not arguing on that point, but uh, sometimes that is how we rescue a baby. Mm. But uh, it's open for the yeah, open for the discussion as well as the comment. Uh, this experience is uh, different from uh, what we experience in UK. Here we have the manpower inadequacy, sometimes the shift basis. We need one-to-one. -one. We say we have 11 ventilators. We need 11 nurses. Sometime in the night, uh, they go for sleeping hours. And then uh, suddenly when you come in the night for a very bad patient, you see three nurses are managing the whole thing. So what, what you see in the uh, what you see in the daytime is not seen in the night. This is a uh, one problem in most of the intensive care unit. Uh, so the uh, so how we the, that is a sort of a culture inside the NICU. So everything uh, uh, amount to this outcome. Uh, I I don't agree that is the right way of doing or uh, either disagree. I'm more neutral on the subject. People can come in, but uh, this is how we make a decision as a group of consultants. Anyway, not starting uh, as a first choice, no, sir. We, uh, many factors affect for that as well. So uh, we can't say that this is the uh, hard and fast, as a rule, hard and fast rule. This is the point, uh, considering many things, yes. We have to uh, uh, consider that background things as well. So that is the answer for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, uh, also, yes, I just want to add something. Now, colistine is there as the reserve group antibiotic. So if anyone wants to start colistine, we have to get sort of a multidisciplinary um, sort of uh, uh, consensus. Uh, not just uh, go and start cholestine. And if uh, your ICU, whatever the place, if you want to start, if you have to start cholestine, then you should think of some, there are some other factors that you have to think of, like now earlier also discussed infection control part, why uh, your babies are getting uh, multi-resistant organisms to give cholestine, that part also need to be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Martha. Um, yes, there is one more coming from uh, Dr. Priyanka Vimalagunavardhana. For the visual longitudinal cue, we could mark the antibiotics below the fever chart in color pencils. This is already done in ICUs, and also sometimes it is done for complicated patients in wards. As one last question, and we will close the question from there. In prescription chart, if patient is on a long period, as an example, treating infective endocarditis, how can we document them? Uh, we have to use the second chart for those cases. We can't address each and everything uh, fit 
for the everything this chart the other thing if you are using for the endocarditis and so on that let's say that, uh, that we are using 10 days here then uh, we are having uh, another lines three or four lines below so uh, people are using the same chart uh, just making day one as 11, yeah. day two as uh, yeah, it's day, easy to matter of putting yeah. in yeah. front of the uh, initial uh, figures. It's easy to do that People because are yeah, that start. also. Yeah. But uh, again, I want to tell the fact that due to some reason, if we have used the chart two or three antimicrobials and we are not having lines below, so we have better to, to go for yeah. Second chart, sorry, second chart. And sheet. Thank you very much. And um, uh, we will conclude the questions. But to make a closing remark, may I please invite Dr. Malika Karnaratna, President of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, actually, first of all, I should thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving us this opportunity and our resource persons, Dr. Dhananjana Ambali and Dr. Deepika Blevatnarachi and our moderators, Dr. Chatri Gunasekar and Dr. Nama Javadana for agreeing to participate uh, in this session with a very short notice. Uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, all of you have gained some uh, knowledge and awareness about the new addition to the my, uh, BHT, antimicrobial prescription chart, and uh, some case scenarios were discussed, uh, uh, giving uh, the suggestions about the antimicrobials, how to uh, uh, choose antimicrobials. I think this is... Uh, you may have gained some knowledge about this. Uh, one thing I need to request after this session, uh, now most of your hospitals, most of your wards have this antimicrobial prescription charts. So please try to introduce it. You can just pass this message to your nursing officers, ward staff, your consultants, or your uh, the matrons, the in-charge nurses. Uh, when, whenever you write, whenever you prescribe an antibiotic on your uh, BHT, please try to convey the message to the nurses to insert an uh, antimicrobial prescription chart to the BHT. And there are certain areas that you have to fill. So uh, you can just fill it then and there. Or after, now, after uh, starting antibiotics, you have to relieve the antibiotics. So like now... Suppose you are reviewing the antibiotics on the second day, so then you can just uh, write uh, the these uh, indications and all, you can just fill. Or it's better if you can just fill it then and there and uh, ask them to insert it to the... Like now you're just filling the in investigation, uh, the forms, you can just write, uh, fill this as well. And also another, the, the second uh, uh, request I want to do is... Uh, uh, please adhere to the antimicrobial guidelines. Now, our college has now just concluded it and launched the uh, national guideline on empirical and uh, prophylactic use of antimicrobials 2024. So it's there. Now we have distributed the soft copy, the uh, the link to the soft copy with all the colleges and every uh, with all the prescribers as much as possible. So if you need uh, to uh, access it, our you can just go to our website also. Sri Lanka College of Micro website has this soft copy, and also hard copies are available for the contributors. So we are going to get more hard copies. Then, uh, if uh, the, the, that is available, we will just inform you. Uh, that's those are the two messages I want to convey. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a small uh, letter of appreciation for our speakers. Uh, can I please have uh, Dr. Suranta Perra, President-elect, Sri Lanka Medical Association, on stage, please? Can we have the moderators ask? Um, first of all, may I 
cordial invite Dr. Deepika Abhevan Narachi, consultant microbiologist from the based hospital, Pangol, to please receive the token of appreciation. Next, uh, our next speaker was Dr. Dhananja Namadi, consultant microbiologist, Colombo North Teaching Hospital. Dr. Chaturi Gunasekara, secretary of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists for moderating the session. Last but not least, Dr. Namal Jayawadhanan, Honorary Joint Secretary of the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists. We thank you all and our online guests as well who joined online. We hope to see you next month, uh, for the month of October, for our next monthly clinical meeting. Thank you and goodbye.